Greetings, everyone, uh, from Privacy Quest Village. And today uh, is the uh, next day of Data Privacy Day 2024. So yesterday, uh, we had the most climatic uh, day of the festival yet. And we had one fireside chat uh, around AI policy landscape. And we followed it up with a privacy role-playing game. And yeah, like uh, privacy professionals from five different continents joined on an adventure uh, led by a dear friend of mine called Tess and she's like a privacy lawyer in Washington and she's having these uh, role-playing game nights to teach game developers about privacy so she was uh, hosting our night so I happen to be one of the players as well so that was really fun for me and today we're back with a fireside chat and uh, Rebecca thank you so much for being here um, and uh, you are one of like the veteran privacy engineers who I had the chance and honor to meet and collaborate uh, during this like uh, journey I was on for the last year or so with the creative privacy stuff. And thank you for like always uh, showing up and like uh, again giving your two cents uh, whenever needed. And I'm really looking forward to learn more about privacy red teaming on this particular event. Uh, so yeah, thank you for being here. And uh, can you please uh, like tell who you are and also. Then I'll just let the conversation flow. Like, what is privacy red teaming, etc. Sure. So, well, first of all, let me just thank you for allowing me to pre-record this because I really wanted to be part of this. But in my time zone, the evening live schedule just didn't work with my family commitments. So as part of my goal of like normalizing that people have a work-life balance. I just want to say like, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate that, you know, we were able to find this compromise of recording. So thank you. Um, so let's see, I've been in privacy since like 2010. Before that, I was a software engineer. And um, I was actually one of those software engineers who was a little bit skeptical about privacy. I remember having a database administrator tell me that, no, I couldn't access the records of all the students at the university I was working for. And I was like, that's really a pain. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but then eventually I started to see like what an interesting space it is and what an interesting problem it is. And um, got my PhD in uh, engineering and public policy, focusing on privacy and eventually went to Google to work on what was called the privacy investigations team, which is a lot like a privacy red team. That's kind of a term that people kind of understand. But I think one of the goals of today is like, let's unpack what red team means and like what a privacy red team is or an AI red team. By the way, yeah. I, I really love the name privacy investigations team. I think it's the coolest privacy team name I've ever heard uh, yet. Yeah, actually, um, I have to give credit to Silvio who started the team because it was actually pi, P-I, pi, and then always using the Greek pi symbol. So yeah, I got to give them credit for that. Um, but I think because of this like ongoing question of what exactly does a privacy red team do, it went few a, a few like rebrandings while we were there. But yeah, we can definitely get more into that, like why you would need to rebrand it and think about like, is red team the right term or not? And I seen your recent LinkedIn post around that says like some uh, researchers came together and they published this thing where like uh, privacy red teaming is not like a magic bullet. You can just throw it and solve like with regard to AI governance, uh, right? Am I uh, recalling it right? So yeah, like I think it's also overhyped somewhere and like the rebranding you just mentioned. So really like uh, where does this fit in the life of let's say a privacy engineer and AI governance expert, let's call it where does it really fit uh, and how do you position yeah. it? Yeah. So let's put like, just kind of a, let's put the exact definition of privacy red team to the side for a second and come back. We, we can say like hand wavy, it means a way to attack your own system to look for privacy vulnerabilities. Like you have ethical hackers who are trying to find privacy vulnerabilities. So that raises a lot of questions, but like, let's just talk about just sort of the privacy AI governance for a company in general. Um, once you get through the compliance, once you have the proper documentation of 
where your data lives, do you have proper purpose, you have your, you know, record of, you know, the, what's yeah, happening yeah. where with your yeah. data. So how do you, how do you actually test? How do you actually measure? Yeah. And so there's a lot of different ways you can test your system, right? So we're talking about definitely going beyond having documentation about it, right? Uh, there's, you can test it by, um, you can test your, your privacy system by doing regular user experience tests, right? Like, is this still what users want? Is this still what users expect? Because privacy expectations change over time. So like this, if you developed like a certain, uh, setting three, four, five years ago, is that even still what users expect it to say? Like, does the definite, you're saying you're deleting data. Are you really deleting it in the way that matches user expectations? So like user experience testing, user research, you can keep doing it over time. Um, user experience testing and privacy is also kind of expensive, <laughs> right? Like actually bringing, finding your users, finding your people, bringing in them, asking the right questions can be hard but it's still worthwhile doing. So that's not necessarily a privacy red team, right? That's just like a privacy test that you can do. It's a way to check, to measure, like GDPR requires that your notices have to be readable, that they have to be understandable. Are you still there? <laughs> so another- I, I, yeah. So the thing is like, yeah. then there should be some concrete privacy metrics that you're, checking to see if they're satisfied like how does that fulfill uh put, put, uh, in, yeah. the pit, in the big so i think one one thing with user testing is you can think about whether it's like for concrete metrics and i wanted to talk about metrics next but you can also do qualitative studies you can also do these studies where you like bring people in and you do an interview you don't even have to bring them in anymore right like you can do it over zoom you can do an interview with them and you can sort of say like oh, these ideas match up, they have this sort of mental model, how can we incorporate that into how we design our product? Um, if you hear these themes over and over, so maybe you find themes, you're not necessarily measuring, or you can, alternatively, you can do user research where you are actually measuring, like how many people, how much time did people spend reading this privacy notice? <laughs> like, did yeah. they spend less than a second with that screen up? Then they're probably not reading it. Do you want them to read it? Like, is it important to you? Are they making a crucial decision? Uh, yeah, so there's, there's different types of user tests that you can do. And yes, you should sort of, for the quantitative ones, you should have a sense of like what you're trying to measure in advance. And, and sometimes there can be a conflict of like what's good for the company versus what's good for the exactly. user. Exactly. I think like privacy metrics could be some whole fireside chats. So like, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just sort of basically the point here is to acknowledge like there's different types of privacy, privacy tests and they're all important. So like user testing is important. Another thing you talked about metrics is just sort of measurement and assurance over time. Um, or so like, for example, you want to keep track of how old your data is. Um, why is this useful? Maybe because you have certain retention, uh, goals, right? Like you only want to keep this data for, maybe you have super sensitive data. You're like, I only want to keep this for 30 days. Or maybe you have other data where you're like, yeah, longer than five years is kind of too much. And you kind of want to have a way to measure how old your data is. And suddenly, if you're seeing the average age of that data is like 10 years, I mean, that would take a little while to happen. Or if the if the average age is now like 40 days when you're expecting it to be maximum 30, that's like a canary in the coal mine. That's when you can start saying like something's wrong. But that requires you to actually have some kind of dashboard or some kind of alert that's like, tell me the average age of my data. And right. So. <laughs> or maybe not average, maybe whenever anything exceeds the retention period, maybe you want to run a scan on your data stores and like check how old it is every day, you know, like, and let you know if anything is too old, right? So there's different things you can measure. And once again, like you said, with the user experience testing, it's such a deep topic, 
right? Like <laughs> we could go on for a long time about like how you choose your metrics, you know, what is it the average that you want to measure or is it like any particular data? Is it the retention? Is it how many people are looking at that data? You know, like, or is it just like how much personal data do you have? Okay. So like one example of um, that, when that's useful is like, you think you have uh, five terabytes of personal data. And then one day you walk in and you have 20. Like, how does that happen? And usually that's going to be a sign where something like got duplicated, but didn't get deleted. And now you have personal data in two places where you didn't expect it. So some of those data can like be a hint at something, some, something in the system failing. Rebecca, I'm like loving what you're telling me because like, like while, while you're describing all these things, like it's just like a treasure hunt game as like a profession and detective like uh, cases. So like you go investigate and find. So I think it's like the coolest privacy role, uh, a privacy engineering sub role, let's call it. Like, I don't know how you call it, the privacy red teaming with the privacy engineering hat. That could be also some uh, topic we could uh, touch upon, but I'm loving it. So like, yeah, that's uh, really, I think, People should know more and hopefully more companies in the world really uh, start utilizing these. So yeah, more more of us can enjoy yeah. these. Uh, yeah. yeah, and I think these are such like great next steps. After you've developed the compliance, after you have a good sense of where your data is, you can start doing user experience tests, monitoring and assurance. And then that still leaves a gap, right? Because that doesn't tell you what an attacker could actually do, right? Like yeah. knowing you have a bunch of personal data that's 40 days old, doesn't tell you if an attacker can access it or not, right? It doesn't tell you if that data could be re-identified. It doesn't tell you if that data can be linked to some other public source of data. Nice, so adversaries in threat modeling is the, again, the idea we're going with. So. Um, that's interesting. So like, because there is not much besides Kim's work and like their team's work, there's not much on privacy threat modeling landscape as well. There are new frameworks coming up, etc. Uh, attack trees and all, but again, like I just want, I wondered because you are basically talking about that the sense, who are the adversaries in that sense? Let's say like retention period, 10 days, uh, after it's like, shouldn't, shouldn't be there. So like, who do you as a the red teamer, like. Who's the uh, usual suspect, suspects, my mm -hmm. question is, with regard to privacy? Yeah, so uh, there's a whole range of adversaries and we can acknowledge that a lot of the adversaries look the same as security adversaries, right? But for privacy, there's the adversaries are specifically looking for user data, right? Whereas the security team might be worried about protecting access to your finances or access to, um, uh, like proprietary information, corporate secrets, a privacy adversary is specifically focused on user data, like information about people. So let's take like a specific example. There's a, this really classic adversary called the nation state adversary, right? So <laughs> these, these adversaries are super scary because it's basically a government paying people and putting a lot of resources to go attack a system. And the security community is also worried about nation state adversaries, right? Because nation state adversaries, they have so many resources, right? It's they, they, they can get access to damage. They do, they can the, do damage. damage. the news that we see, like, yeah, with everything with Pegasus, with the nuclear facilities in I ran the spec, what, I don't know, Stuxnet, was it? The uh, mm -hmm. So all these are actually state-backed uh, things that just like you mentioned. So yeah, for viewers, I just want to say, yeah. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. The, the nation state adversary model, ch threat model changes a little bit when you're specifically talking about privacy because the threat, the attack on a nuclear power plant is maybe less of a privacy concern. Of course, you get into like all these other issues of like personal autonomy when a power plant is attacked. 
But when you're specifically thinking about the nation state adversary as a privacy threat, they still have those resources. They still have tons of computing power. They can use that to break encryption, maybe. They can use that to re-identify data sets, but they can also use it to target um, journalists. They can use it to target, um, <laughs> I'm blanking on the, the term right now, the party, the political party that's not in power. <laughs> right uh, like opposition yeah like opposition parties right yeah or dissidents or whatever like so they can be specifically targeting people as opposed to like another country's resources and one of the problems with the nation state adversary is that they particularly if they're targeting their own citizens they already have a lot of data that they can link Right, like they they know where you live because they know how much you earn because you pay taxes to them. They know where you live because you had to apply for a passport. Right, so like and now they have all the yeah. Go I ahead. think like it was only China, but now there are like providers uh, here, like in Turkey as well, that just like do uh, mass scale uh, facial recognition and surveillance on the Turkish citizens. So they sell these as border control stuff. But I'm sure that like uh, even like us are being subject to not only like where I live, not it's just like uh, where I am at every moment. So I think that's uh, something when democracies fail, I think like, yeah, the citizens have uh, lose much more than their privacy. And yeah, it's like mind control levels at certain points with, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's another thing that makes nation state adversaries so scary is just the amount of harm they can do, right? Like they can put you in jail in some parts of the world. They can execute you legally, right? Like this is a very scary adversary, but there is this whole scale of adversaries who have like top of the list. Nation state adversaries can cause a lot of harm. They have a lot of resources but there's not that many of them, right? It's not the most frequent adversary. And just in terms of like peer quantity, there aren't as many countries as there are people. <laughs> so like you could sort of, if you were looking at adversaries in terms of how much computing power they have, how much money they have, how much like time they can spend on this, there's a whole scale. Like it could also be like data brokers could be an adversary or even your ex-partner just like a regular person you know average joe could be an adversary and so if we take this like i don't mean to apply a gender to it average joe just kind of is a term <laughs> like we could say average josephine or average you know gender neutral name but you know like let's just use the term average joe to refer to someone who doesn't particularly have a lot of security knowledge they don't particularly have extra computing resources. They aren't really necessarily well-versed in how to re-identify a data set. You know, they're not gonna look at this data and be like, oh, I know how to link based on the timestamp, but they're gonna, they're also gonna be motivated, right? They're gonna be like, I bet I can get access to this person's mobile phone. Like, hey, can you share that cooking recipe with me? Like, let me use your phone, ch -ch 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 do a few things. And so there's this, the point is there's this whole scale of adversaries. Right, average Joe to nation state adversary and somewhere in between. Security, yeah? security term for the like the, the lowest in the ecosystem is like script kitties, which like you mentioned are individuals who just learn to uh, piece together some like hacking tools and like uh, Linux commands to really uh, learn to do it. But they are the majority in the security landscape, right? Those script kitties it's... causing more problems. So honestly, for the privacy attacker. It doesn't even have to be a script kitty, yeah. right? Like, it doesn't even. Just like it can ex be... girlfriend, ex boyfriend, uh, it could be a family member, a co worker, anyone who. Yeah. yeah. And they don't even have to be particularly motivated to learn, like, how to write a script or how to use a command yeah. line or how to, you know, they can sometimes these adversaries just like have access to data. So, like, an example is um, a nurse who can look up patient information in the hospital. And they can be, they don't intend to do anything wrong, but they're like, you know, I'm really curious about my grandkids health and like my daughter-in-law hasn't really been in touch. So I'm just going to look up my grandkid in the hospital system. That's a privacy violation, right? That's not a script kitty, right? Like that's not, it's more like 
because the design of the hospital system didn't really have the right controls in place, this person's an adversary, but like, they're not a bad guy. There's like no, not necessarily bad intentions there. So there's this whole range. And so there's, there's plenty of examples in privacy of people just kind of like being curious about people they know in a way that oversteps bounds. And then the design of the system lets them. Like, however that feature is built, it somehow allowed them to pretty easily learn information that would otherwise be considered private. So for ordinary internet folk who came to this uh, recording somehow, uh, always don't be afraid of state actors, uh, but be careful of your close circle, family and friends in privacy threats. Uh. <laughs> Is that a <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Well, I mean, I don't know. So, the, you know, my theory is like life is so busy as it is that like putting all the expectation on the average person to like protect themselves against their mother-in-law and a nation state adversary, that's too much. So we should definitely be designing systems that don't allow this, right? Like it's our job as privacy and the engineers that are in companies that are building these features to be aware of these adversaries and to protect our people, our users against them. Exactly. So like make it as much as possible privacy by default. <laughs> and one certain parameter here is the likelihood, right? So like you said, those who have the resources, the computing power and the money to attack you doesn't have the motivation. So in likelihood aspect, that's how you allocate the resources and where you to protect. So again, this was, um, I think like I, I'm really liking because like I'm building bridges between what I learned with Kim during the threat modeling and what you're saying now with red teaming. So yeah, it's like an active learning process. So <laughs> sorry for interruptions, Rebecca, but yeah. So like as a privacy like engineer again, and like with regard to the festival and the team is battle for AI. Can you like talk about like how does it fit with the AI governance then like the privacy red teaming in general? Yeah. So. What we're seeing in, in industry is there aren't that many companies that have privacy red teams. Um, I know of four and they're large tech companies that have something that more or less can be called a privacy red team. There may be other companies that are doing something similar. This kind of like a smart humans going in, trying to be the adversary and testing the system but the, the companies aren't really talking about it or they're not really framing it as a privacy red team or there may be security teams. But your question was about AI governance. And so we're definitely seeing a lot more talk about AI red teams than privacy red teams. And there's definitely more companies that claim to have an AI red team. And in the US, uh, Joe Biden's executive order on, I forget the exact name, AI safety or AI responsibility, specifically called out AI red teams, but they didn't know what it was either. So they, they handed it off to NIST, the National Institute of Standards of Technology. And they said, NIST, tell us what an AI red team is. And so right now that call is out. If you have thoughts on what a AI red team should be, you can sort of write your statement for NIST to read and it'll be taken into consideration. Nice. Right? Thanks. Thanks for sharing that everyone to hear yeah. as well. <laughs> I mean, I hope it's, I actually don't know when the cutoff date is. So I hope this video gets released in time. Um, I'll do my best to put it, put it in uh, this week then. Or, or worst case, you can go read lots of people's opinions. Like once they've me. already submitted. <laughs> I'm like, you can be part of the debate of like what an AI red team is. But AI red teams tend to be sort of like this human testing, human intelligence, like um did this large language model hallucinate so it might include like asking a question about biology and having a biologist check like is this information correct or is this a hallucination so that right now is kind of covered in the ai red team scope but privacy is also a part of it right like an ai red team should also definitely check the output like is this Releasing PII, is there like memoization? Is the is it like the training personal information and the training data coming out 
in the output, an AI red team that has access to sort of how the model is built could also look at the training data. And they could say, was this model trained on differentially private data? They could say, was the PII removed before it was trained? There's a lots of different ways privacy can be included in a red team, in an AI red team. I think the takeaway here is like, no one really knows exactly right now. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> like, that's, that's the whole theme of the festival. So there are lots of questions asked and there are no clear answers. So I'm loving it that we're also asking the right questions. Uh, so like, uh, I think we're on the right track. And to, to again, like now I'm gonna uh, uh, refer to Swati. Uh, so she and I are currently working on this, like the first AI governance quest on the uh, PK platform. So like we've been already been working for like a month or half now. And basically one of the puzzles there is about like the explainability AI, the XAI part. And there like we uh, are uh, involving tools like Lime and Shap to like have these like uh, certain uh, explainability scores, let's call it. Like why did this decision? But again, these are only applicable to certain learning methods, machine learning uh, algorithms. So like if it's a black box, it's then how do you do it? So they write these uh, like uh, prompts that says like, all right, before you write your next prompt, tell us what you think before writing it. So that's how also one of the methods like you just mentioned uh, that I know of. But again, I'm really excited because like, yeah, like there are lots of things to explore as this AI supercharge and beca becoming mainstream. I'm really happy because all the, in my humble opinion, all the privacy engineer, engineering skills that a one has and yet invested so far is really applicable to this world. And that's why I'm really uh, excited to see like what's the intersection here, uh, etc. And yeah, th thank you, Rebecca. I just, yeah. So one thing about like um, uh, AI red teaming and AI governance is there's a lot of different principles at stake, right? There's um, fairness, explainability, transparency, accuracy, privacy, and, um, et cetera. Yeah. And what? Interpretability kind of like list goes on. Yeah. Like it's too vast and too broad. Yeah. And we, <laughs> how are we going to measure all that? And how are we going to measure trade-offs? So. And this is an open question, like I don't have the answer, mm -hmm. right? And I think it's one thing that makes testing and hard is like, okay, if we find that um, we can make this model more explainable, but it's gonna reveal more information about the people in the training set. Like, oh, we gave you this answer because most people who, I don't know, whatever it is, most people who sleep on the left side of the bed also, use this product, you know, like whatever it is, like it's going to start review. I totally, that's a random example, but like, <laughs> like if we start explaining that, then we're also giving away some information. And I think the same thing with fairness, there's a trade-off because we're like protecting minority voices. Cause one thing we do in privacy is we remove outliers, right? Like this outlier is going to stand out. This person is going to look different than everyone else. So if we leave them in the data set, they're going to stand out. So what does that mean for fairness, right? Like if we start removing outliers, are we also Seriously. removing? Yeah. Like then you're taking out all the, I'm going to come up with a, another like random <laughs> example. You're going to take out all the Swahili speakers in Minnesota, you know, like, is that fair? Like, don't we want to include them? Don't they matter? You know? So like, this is kind of like a, we're going to be bumping up against these trade-offs. Whenever we have these lists of principles, we're going to be, it's going to be really interesting. We're going into this really interesting time of thinking through how do we test? How do we measure? And then when we have all these like principles, that we want to test for how do we <laughs> how do we balance them if we find that we have to make a trade-off where do we put that that was just like a question for the privacy community to have fun with and also like maybe an open call to participate in these kind of questions and because uh like 
we need all the different voices in the privacy community and in the privacy engineering community and in AI responsibility. So like if any of these sound compelling to any of your listeners, like please come work on it. You know, <laughs> like we want your voice, we want your opinion, we want your thoughts. Um, thank you so much, Rebecca. I think like it was a great session. Just to, again, uh, always a pleasure to talk to you and learn from you while doing it so. Uh, so uh, I think like it's really important for like veterans, privacy engineering veterans like you, uh, like show, show up and spare your precious time from your family, from your uh, work. So I'm really humbled uh, that I was your uh, co-host uh, for tonight. And uh, for all those viewers uh, out there who's going to watch it in the future, in two weeks, let's say one week. Uh, yeah. Uh, greetings from, uh, yeah. <laughs> Privacy Quest Village. Thank you so much, Rebecca, and hope to collaborate more uh, on the PK Village with you. Uh... Yeah, likewise. Thank you. And good luck Thank to everyone on the quest. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye, everyone.